All right, so we're glad to see you this morning here at Catalyst Church. If you were with us last week, we started a week one of a sermon series that we are in together, in which we are looking at the in and outs of what we are about here at Catalyst. <clears throat> Why are we here? What is our identity? <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, specifically, what is our identity as it pertains to the kingdom of God as a whole? We have an understanding here that we are a part of, of what God is doing around the world within his kingdom. And we looked a little bit at that concerning our vision here at Catalyst Church. And Kent shared it with us a few moments ago. But our vision here is that we will reach the world with the real Jesus one person at a time. One person at a time. And in order to kick this series off, we got to hear from a few of our folks, a couple of our folks here in the church, and then one of the missionaries that we support about local missions and global missions around the world. Zeba Shob shared of her missions trip in the Appalachian Mountains to go out and help families. Uh, she dug some trenches, got to do a lot of that kind of work, and really, really thankful for the stories that she brought back. Our girl Carolyn McMahon, I can't see her, but I'm pointing at her that way. Um, Carolyn McMahon, uh, she shared of her mission trip that she went on in Malawi, and I'm kind of proud of myself. I got that right. I pronounced it right. So she, she talked about her mission trip in Malawi and how that changed her life and changed her perspective about what it looks like to, uh, to, serve, to serve Jesus. And then we also heard from Chris Vilwalk uh, about his work that him and his family are doing overseas. He started in Bosnia and then went to Budapest, but they still minister in Bosnia, and they do an online ministry. And we heard a really, really uh, fantastic t testimony about the work that the Lord is doing through that ministry. And we had a video that Chris sent last week, and I've had some people asking, hey, can we make that video accessible? Can we go and watch it? Well, you're in luck. This is kind of a plug for the church YouTube page, but we have actually got his video on YouTube a Catalyst Church YouTube page. And if you have not liked and subscribed to that page yet, I want to encourage you to go ahead and do that. You can do it while I'm speaking. I don't care. But go ahead, like and subscribe to the YouTube page, and you'll be able to see uh, the video that Chris sent us last week. So when I think about that, what it, what it looks like to reach the world for the real Jesus, one person at a time, can I... Can I get a little bit transparent with you this morning? Is that okay with you? Okay. When I initially heard that, I didn't exactly like it at first. I didn't. It's not that I disagreed with it. It's just I struggle with this thing called patience. Anybody else struggle with patience? I want to see hands. Okay. I struggle with this thing called patience. And I'm one of those guys that in the past, and I'm trying to figure this out now, but I'm like, I want to put as little effort as I can in, yet expect a, uh, expect a ton of impact. So I'm like, one person at a time, can't we do that like more than one person at a time? I mean, like, like at least give me 10 or 15 Reach the, reach the world for the real Jesus, 15, 20, 100 people at a time. That might make things a little bit better, but the reality is that's not necessarily how we see Jesus model it in Scripture. When you look in Scripture, you look at the life and ministry of Jesus. Yeah, he spoke to these large crowds. He even had a small group of 12 men who, who he did life with. But we see that lives were changed often in these one-on-one -on -one moments that he had with people. You know, what I want to talk about this morning is part of who we are here at Catalyst, and you're going to see it on the screen here. Let me turn this on. Okay. You'll see it on the screen here. This is part of who we are. We are real people with real problems serving the real Jesus, pursuing the real Jesus. If you come into, or when you came into the worship center this morning, the worship area, and you look over the doorway, 
you will see these words, real people, real problems, real Jesus, because it, it's a reminder that when we are in this place together, we have to remind ourselves that we are real people with real problems, all with the common goal of pursuing the real Jesus. Our girl, Abby Tate, I'm going to embarrass her a little bit, but she did a great job with the cricket machine. Y'all know the cricket machine? Y'all ever work with those? Okay, we got some cricketers here in the church. But she did a good job getting those letters up for us, uh, up for us above uh, the doorway there. So let that be a reminder that we are here, real people, real problems, pursuing a real Jesus. And honestly, that's one of the things that attracted me here to Catalyst Church. Because I have been in environments before where people are seen as real, where their problems are seen as real. But once those problems begin to kind of seep out, it kind of makes people uncomfortable. And instead of dealing with those problems, instead of encouraging, there's almost this kind of environment that is created where they're like, okay, you're a real person. We get it that you have real problems, but just... There's people becoming uncomfortable. Can you kind of just calm it down a little bit? And I've realized those environments, they don't really make a whole lot of room for people to grow, for people to to learn what their real problems may be and become who Jesus wants them to be. And I'll say this personally, that I have developed relationships over the past year and a half or so since I have been here where people have seen me at my best but also people have seen me at my not-so-best. When you develop relationships with people like we push here, intentionally here at Catalyst Church, you're going to be able to see the shortcomings, the problems that come in people's lives. And instead of getting down on myself, getting upset about the problems I have, I have been given room to grow. been given room to see what it, what it looks like for the fact that I am a real person, admitting my real problems, but pursuing the real, the real Jesus. And that space has allowed me to grow and continue to grow into the person and the minister that God desires for me to be. And I hope that that space allows everyone in this room to grow as well like it has helped me. But we see a perfect example of this within John's gospel in John chapter 4. And if you have your Bibles with you, I want you to go ahead Turn to John chapter 4. We're going to be camping out there together this morning. And as you're turning there, just to kind of give a little bit of background of where we're going to be, when you look at John's gospel as a whole, you will see that his purpose in writing his gospel was to show Jesus' true identity, to show people who Jesus truly is, who he truly was, to show people the real Jesus Um, And to do this, we see that John, he shares this story of an interaction that Jesus has with a real person who has very real problems and how this person is invited to know to follow the real Jesus. And the first six verses of John chapter 4 really give us context for John's portrayal of the real Jesus. And here's what we read. We read that now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was going, uh, gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but it was his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, he sat down by the well. And we read that it was about noon. Here's the thing. If you have been at Catalyst Church for any amount of time, when it comes to reading your Bible, you will know that context matters. Context matters. Can you say that with me? Context matters. So what's the context of what we are looking at here? Well, the Pharisees, they are beginning to pump up the pressure on Jesus. These legalistic religious leaders who are not accepting Jesus' real identity, who he truly is. So he leaves Judea in the south to head to Galilee in the north. But there's an important part of these first several verses that it can be easy to overlook, but at the same time, 
It gives us insights into something that we cannot miss. Look at verse 4 one more time. We read this. Now he had to go through Samaria. Did he really have to go through Samaria? Well, there's a couple different ways that you can look at this. First, I want you to look at these, these maps that you're going to see up here. This would have been a logical perspective. This would have logically been the way that they would have went. Uh, this is your, your point A to point B, right? And here's the thing about this. Uh, it would have been downhill. So it wouldn't have required a lot of hiking uphill. It would have been downhill because in Scripture, whenever you hear them say, if they're in Galilee and it says they went up to Jerusalem, even though Jerusalem is in the south, uh, it would have been up a mountain. So that's what they mean when they went up to Jerusalem. So this point A, A to B line would have made most sense. I know it would have made most sense for me. Um, here's the thing. Growing up, I grew up in the Blue Ridge Mountains, southwest Virginia, beautiful part of the country. And if we were going places in the area when I was younger, I would try to get my dad and my mom to take a scenic route so that we could see the mountains. And my dad, I, jokingly, one day, when I requested one of these routes, very vivid to me, he goes, son, <laughs> gas doesn't grow on trees. Gas isn't free. And I heard that, and I thought it was funny. And then I had to get a job and start putting gasoline in my car. And it occurred to me that he, he actually had a point so um, I said, you know what, I think, I think I'm going to do this just A to B, the logical way to get places. But then you have this other way. This is like a religious and cultural perspective here. See, if you were a very pious Jew, a very uh, zealous Jew, you would have taken another route that would have sent you around Samaria into Galilee. So what they would have done is they would have went, they, you see the bottom here, that's the Dead Sea. Around the Dead Sea area, they would have crossed the Jordan River, they would have went up north, and then around the Decapolis area, that's another important place in Scripture where people didn't really like to go, but they, maybe they went through there a little bit, and they would have crossed back over the Jordan River to get into Galilee, just so they would not have to interact with any Samaritan people. You see Samaria right there in the middle. So why, why would this have been a route that they would have went instead of the other route? Well, there's a lot of tension between Jews and Samaria when you look at the or Samaritans when you look at the history of Israel. But simply put, the Jews viewed the Samaritans as these religious half-breeds. And here's what I mean. They adopted portions and sections of the Old Testament law, but they also combined that with some of their own superstitions that they had about, uh, that they had about the world. So it made it for a very, very mucky, very, very messy way to practice religion. And for a, for a Jew... This is actually the first route that would have came to mind. It wouldn't have came to mind, let's just go the, the shortest way possible. They would have went out of their way specifically to avoid going through Samaria and interacting with Samaritans. But no, we read that Jesus had to take this route. Jesus had to go through Samaria and what we'll see is that Jesus, he often challenges our comfort in order to show who he really is. And not only does he go through Samaria, but he makes a pit stop in this town called Sychar. So the question remains, why did Jesus have to go through Samaria? Well, he had to go through Samaria because he knew that he would have an interaction with a real person who had real problems who needed to be shown the real Jesus. And this is where we continue in verse 7. We see, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? 
and his disciples, they had gone into the town to buy food. But the Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not, do not associate with Samaritans. So culturally and religiously, this woman would have been a casualty to the three-strike rule. First of all, she is a woman, especially a woman who would be talking to a rabbi. That really didn't happen. Also, she is a Samaritan, and we also talked about that um, uh, tense nature between Samaritans and Jews. Uh, but also, and what we're going to see here in the next little bit is that she had a past that was filled with some real problems. And not just a past, but she was currently going through real problems in her life. And the thing is, she understood who she was, kind of to an extent. This woman, it sounds like, it sounds like she knows the routine. You're a Jew, so high and mighty with your religious excellence, and I'm just this, I'm just this half-breed Samaritan woman. And Jesus, he was with her alone, which might add a little bit to a potential scandal there. But society and culture has told this woman loud and clear who she truly was and where her place was. But here's the thing. Yes, Jesus understood who she really was. Yes, Jesus knew of her real problems. But more important than any of that, Jesus knew who he really was and why he was having this interaction with this woman. Real people, real problems, real Jesus. And we continue in verse 10. That Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it was that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Well, sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Well, Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. So this woman's request here, it's pretty logical. It wouldn't have been easy to come to this well and back, especially during the hottest part of the day. It was around noon. Uh, if you hadn't seen this story before, if you weren't very familiar with it, maybe you would expect Jesus to respond with this, to this woman by saying something along the lines of, you know, no, silly. I'm not talking about that. I'm, I'm talking about man's need for a living, non-stagnant spiritual water that only I, the real Jesus, can provide. But that's not how Jesus responds. In fact, Jesus takes quite an aggressive detour. And he begins to expose this woman's real problems. Here's what he said. He told her, go call your husband and come back. Uh, I have no husband, she replied. Well, Jesus said to her, you are right when you say that you have no husband. And then he gets to the real problems. He says, the fact is that you've had five husbands. And the man that you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Well, sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet and this, I find this kind of funny because given what Jesus had just said, she's kind of trying to get the conversation off of her past towards something else, kind of as a distraction. But she continues and says, Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, Believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know, but we worship what we do know for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, 
for they are the kind of worshipers that the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. So here's the thing. There is a ton of things going on here. There is a ton to unpack with Jesus' words. But given everything that the Samaritans believed, the Samaritan woman does consider a very important piece of the puzzle with the statement that she says in the very next verse. Here's what she says in verse 25. The woman said, I know that uh, Messiah, who's called Christ, is coming. And when he comes, he will explain everything to us. And then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. I am the real Jesus. So here's the thing. If we were to stop there, we see a very, very accurate story. A very true story of a real person with real problems being shown the power and identity of the real Jesus. But I just kind of want to tease where we're going to be going next week and the, and the week after um, with the sermons that Scott is going to be preaching. And I want you to look uh, at what we read a couple of verses later about this encounter. We read that then this woman, Samaritan woman, leaving her water jar, the woman came back to the town and said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? And they came out of the town and made their way toward him. You skip down to verse 39 there in your Bibles. We read that many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. So not only are they traveling through Samaria, not only do they make this pit stop in Sychar, but they also stay there a couple of more days. Verse 41, And because of his words, many more became believers. And they said to the Samaritan woman, We no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. You know, over the course of this series, we're going to continue to dig deeper into this part of our vision, which states that we will introduce the world to the real Jesus. How many people at a time? One person at a time. Here's the thing. That's nothing new. We just simply take what Jesus did and apply it to our lives. It's really cool what happens when you take what Jesus did in Scripture and model it into your own life. See, Jesus, he had those moments, right, in which he talked to large groups of people, but he also had those moments where he had these one-on-one -on -one interactions, like we saw in our text this morning, in which a real person with real problems, life was changed by the real Jesus. And because Jesus reached this one person, it led many other Samaritans to putting their faith in him. Real people... Real problems, real Jesus. So we've seen this morning that uh, how it has played out in the context of Scripture. But what does that look like for you and I in our context, in our culture today? What does that look like? What does that mean for us here at Catalyst Church? Well, let's begin to break this down just a little bit. First, we are a church of real people we got to understand there are real people we interact with on a daily basis. You know, as I was figuring out how, how, do we, how do I describe this idea of real people, I was praying about it and God just put it on my heart. Just think about all the individuals that make up the church body here at Catalyst. So I started going up and down the rows and trying to figure out who generally has sit, sits where. We don't have assigned seating, but I know kind of where, where people tend to sit. And I begin to have y'all on my mind. I hope that doesn't sound creepy. But I begin to think about each and every individual here. And I just thought about uh, the different jobs, the different occupations we have here. We have teachers. We have those who work in um, finance. We have leaders in companies. 
We have engineers here. We have musicians, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then I thought about the makeup, the diverse makeup here at Catalyst Church. Uh, we have people from different parts of the United States, but really we also have people from different parts of the world here at Catalyst, which is really cool. But no matter what, uh, what our job is, what our ethnicity is, we have to realize that we are all just, we, we are a group of real people just trying to figure this life thing out, trying to get through life. Because part of our realness, part of our humanity for that matter, is that we all are people, regardless of where we are from, what our job is, we are real people with imperfections that we don't need to try to hide here, but that we need to improve on and encourage one another in that quest to do so. So we know we are real people, but we also know that we have some real problems. If you look at this woman's issues in Scripture, they were, they were quite glaring. They were quite obvious, especially in her culture. And here's the thing. We are a relational discipleship church here at Catalyst. Relationships are paramount. You heard it from Kent at the very beginning. You're going to hear that drilled into your minds from Scott and others here, but we are a relational discipleship church here. And we have to realize that when we build relationships with people, that we are going to be able to better see their real problems, the things in their life that they may be uh, struggling with. Here at Catalyst, we try to be very intentional about creating relational spaces for real people to work through their real problems and another hook, one of those spaces are our connection groups. And if you haven't gotten connected to one of our connection groups here at Catalyst Church, it's not too late. It's not too late. And if you're interested in that and you're not connected yet, come find me, come hunt me down, grab me, say, Richie, I want to talk to you about connection groups. I don't care how aggressive you are about it. I would love to talk with you about that. Uh, but I do also want to ask this. What if the real problems that we encounter, that we hear from other people, what if they kind of come out of left field? What if they are quite, quite shocking and surprise you about someone? I was talking to a ministry friend of mine about uh, his experiences with uh, coordinating his uh, small group ministry at his church, and he was sharing stories with me about the things that they were uh, experiencing, about things that were going on in their small groups. And uh, while, I'm, while I'm giving the story, I, I just want to invite the band to come, come up as we prepare to wrap things up. But he told me the story about one of his small groups. And while they were there, his small group leader could tell that something was off. He could tell that it was kind of a tense group meeting. He didn't know exactly what was going on, but it was obvious something wasn't right. So he told his group members, hey, we're going to pray together, and after we pray, we're just going to sit here. Something doesn't seem quite right, and we need to figure something out. So they prayed, and then after that, they just stood in awkward silence for about 10, 15 minutes. The group leader wouldn't let anybody go anywhere, and come to find out that the reason it felt so tense is because there was a man in the group who was having an affair on his wife who was sitting right beside him. And you talk about a pretty real, pretty real problem, but it wasn't just the affair. The affair that he was having was with a woman who was sitting right across the table from him and his wife in the same group. I asked my friend, I said, what in the world did y'all do? Like, how did, you, how did your group respond to that? And he said that he was talking with this small group leader. And he said that the group just loved on this couple. Admit it, yeah, that is a real problem. And real restoration needs to happen. But the cool thing is that regardless of the problems that were going on in their marriage with the, the tense moment in that group, Jesus was realer than any of that. And I asked him, I said, man, how are things going now? Any updates? And he said, well, 
unfortunately, there was a divorce that happened. But they are still coming to the church because they felt loved. They felt cared for because they knew that it was a a group of people with real problems, or real people with real problems pursuing the real Jesus. And that leads us to the last piece of this puzzle. You know, Mahatma Gandhi, he once said, I like your Christ, but I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. And I just kind of marinated on that a little bit. And over my life, I've been a Christian for 22 years, and I think about that, and I'm like, man, as frustrated as that makes me, I can't fully disagree with that. How does that make you feel? I like your Christ, but I do not like your Christians. Regardless of how that makes you feel, the question is, what are you going to go out and do about it? Real people, real problems, real Jesus. On a daily basis, we interact with real people, whether it's at work, at school, in our families, in our jobs, whatever that may look like. But all those real people that we interact with, they're going to have real problems. Real problems that might make us uncomfortable. But the reality is, is that the discomfort of those real problems, they really test how on board we really are with this vision to reach real people with real problems serving the real Jesus. So how will you work towards that this morning to showing the world the real Jesus? How many people at a time? One person at a time.